Welcome to Wildspire. You get to be a fly on the wall for my intimate conversations with entrepreneurs who are changing the world. I'm your host, Stephanie Benedetto, coach, storyteller, and unmarketer at The Awakened Business, helping coaches and change-making entrepreneurs unleash their inspired message and share it with playful unmarketing. I'll ask curious questions and explore uncharted waters with my guests today. Anything can happen when we step into the unknown of infinite creativity, and that's where we're going to play. My guest today is Robert Party, a wonderful human, and I'm surprised it took me this long to invite him onto my podcast. What I know about Robert is that you can expect vibrancy, honesty, a rawness, a willingness to not only acknowledge the shit that happens in our lives, but to get right up in it and make something out of it. This image came up so powerfully in our conversation, and I think it really speaks to what Rob's message is for the world. If you don't like it, it's time to do something different. Let me tell you a little bit more about Robert Party. Robert is one of those rare individuals who thrives on change and is the founder of Possibility in Action, a transformative methodology empowering individuals to shape their destinies through intentional living and identity shifting. Drawing from a journey of continual reinvention, he guides seekers through his books, workshops, and coaching, unlocking possibilities, shaping desired futures, and elevating lived experience. With a raw and direct approach, Robert awakens personal responsibility and inspires purposeful living. I must also warn you that this conversation includes many, many F-bombs, especially towards the end. So if this concerns you, I warn you against playing this around children or for yourself. Without further ado, let me introduce you to Robert Party. Hi, Rob, and welcome to the Wildspire podcast. I'm so happy to see you. I am thrilled to be here. Uh, I'm thrilled to talk to you whenever I get the chance to talk to you. So. <laughs> oh, so I consider you to be a fellow adventurer, an explorer of life. And now both of us have somehow found ourselves in the situation of being what some people call an expat or an immigrant, Americans living in Europe. and. Yeah. I was kind of wondering, because this is fresh in the journey for me, like, what, what is it? Like, if you were going to kind of show me the arc that brought you to where you are right now, what is that? How did you end up living where you are? And I know you've made a transition even more recently, so I'll leave it broad, but you can take that however you want, because I know it's going to be fun. It's, 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 it's also law, right? It's funny you use the word like adventurer and explorer because actually on my vision board, which is behind the screen at the moment, but I can see part of it, is a guy with an Indiana Jones hat. Because that is part of the story I want to live. So if we look at like, like the whole arc, the arc is intentionally deciding to live my life as a story. But of course, life also creates deviation, right? We're not just going to walk in a straight line to anything. So, you know, you, you know my story. I, I was an ex-investment banker. I'm a New York City kid. I had that type of lifestyle, not from, quote, a real passion. But, you know, I grew up with an abusive alcoholic dad. For me, the kid thought money would save him. And I grew up with Ronald Reagan and Gordon Gekko and Dynasty in Dallas. And so therefore, yes, money was going, money was it, right? And uh, during that time, met my wife. We fell in love, amazing woman. She was diagnosed very young with cancer. And over her 11-year journey with cancer, I really redefined 
life. I really, everything about life. And also she decided to enter the field of palliative care, which palliative care is very confused with hospice, but palliative care is about the quality of life during the tra trajectory of an illness. Well, quality of life is what I also wanted to create for myself. So when she passed away, honestly, and it sounds cold, but I'm, I'm a realist and she was a realist, but I said, okay, to be perfectly honest, I said, well, okay, there's a whole bunch of shit in front of me, so I can either try to ignore it or I can use it as fertilizer and plant something in it and see what comes from it. And the question that came to mind was, what great story can I live because of this? And I always wanted to live in Italy. Had no idea how I was going to arrive here. By the time she passed away, she had metastatic breast cancer for 11 years. So whatever money I did make as an investment banker went away. She was diagnosed when she was 30, so we never thought about life insurance. So I show up in Italy, left everything, and I was teaching English for $8 an hour until I could get my footing. And that's what's so great, right? Because what I realized in all of this, if, if I take it from the childhood or the thing with Desiree or moving to Italy, that $8 an hour wasn't a sacrifice. It was an investment in a future. It was cool. I was actually willing to teach. In, I'm an MBA from Columbia, right? Teaching English for $8 an hour. My niece and nephew were making more money than me in McDonald's. And thinking, but I'm building something. You know, the, the thing about getting away from my dad, I was building something that the life Desiree and I lived, we were building something regardless of the timeline. So it was all that intentionality, right? To write the story. That's what I want to look back on. I want to look back on that my hand held a pen that wrote narrative to the things that were out of my control. And that's what brought me to this immigrant lifestyle, which I don't know if you've had this experience. I'd love to know this. Um, because now I really understand the immigrant lifestyle, which I think is so, so cool because I became fluent in Italian, but when I moved here, I didn't speak Italian. And regardless that I'm fluent, I can't express myself, my true nature in the language because it's not my native language. And I realized this disconnect and why immigrants, at least in the United States, like I think of my family, you know, the Italian American family hung out with and were lived in regions of New York City with other Italians because they could truly express themselves. And I was like, wow, self-expression is is really a key to the to living a quality life. And I had to find that identity in the foreign language. And it was it was so amazing because we create our identity as children without realizing it. And to have to actually physically, mentally start to piece it together and say, well, you know, because they don't say, for example, it's raining cats and dogs in Italian. It's something like crickets. And I don't, I don't know what falls from the sky in Italy, but you know, it's not cats and dogs. So, or like you and I could joke about Tony the Tiger or, or something like that, right? Can't do that here because they, they don't know who that is. So like we talked about Dynasty in Dallas and all that other stuff. That's part of our culture. I can't use those things. I don't know how to express that same type of thing. So I found that all very interesting in terms of part of the arc was not just the story, but creating the identity of the person that was living that story as an expat or immigrant. And I don't know what your feeling is on that. I know this is somewhat new for you to have moved, but. Yeah, it is new, Rob. And I, I can't say that I've had a full experience of it yet. I do understand staying with the people you can communicate with more because I've, I've come up against tremendous resistance in speaking Portuguese when my Portuguese is so very poor, in my opinion, with other people. And yet I started to do it. And mostly when I do, like there are some locals who will help me and play with me 
and teach me a little bit. And I'm starting to understand my ear is developing so I can actually hear things that were too subtle or too strange for me to understand before. But actually what I relate to the most in what you said is that I am, I am currently living with my partner who's originally from Germany. So English is not his native language, for one, and I believe speaks very, very fluent English. But America is not his, na his native culture either. And so we have those two things going on. And sometimes I'll say something and he'll be like, what? Or he'll say, I don't know if you have a word for that in English. Like he's trying to express something that German has a very specific concept for. And, and, and it's interesting because it shows me these, these assumptions that I have in the way I communicate and what people know and what's relatable and what isn't. And it, I just have to think about it differently or I become aware of it at some point if I'm not thinking about it. If we're watching an American TV show or if we're watching um, a European TV show that has something about Germany, like the things that are cultural references that have deep, deep associations for him, I don't get. And the same for me and you with America, he doesn't get. But rather than seeing that as an impediment to our communication, I see it as an invitation to just open up and see what I haven't been seeing. And my, my world is broadening because of it. That's kind of the experience I've been having. And it is a journey and it has been more challenging than I thought, um, especially being in a country where but I'm, I'm lucky that I speak English because so many people speak English here, especially yeah. right now I'm on the island of Madeira. It's even more so than in mainland Portugal. Um, but every once in a while, I, I meet someone, I met someone, a woman in the park started speaking to me in Portuguese and I, I couldn't catch anything. So I used my meager Portuguese and I said, and I said, uh, fala English, you know, like, do you speak English? <laughs> And she just kept jabbering at me. And I said, now in Bandu, which is, I don't understand, you know, what like, help. And, and she just kept talking to me. And, and I, we didn't really get anywhere, but it was kind of funny. And I thought it was great. This, for me, it was progress that I actually used a little Portuguese, you know? Well, I, I don't know if there, there's two things that you said that I, I just think are incredible. The idea of the invitation, that was one thing that I found so helpful for my own growth was to step back and be an observer, right? Because we get so used to things in our quote comfort zone, right? Like in, in the, in the States, we know how it all works. We know what mannerisms are dictating even from across the room. Like, and then all of a sudden you you're in a situation where you have to connect more to the intention and the energy that is, is, is floating around. So like even with this woman, right, I found my, myself many times at the beginning not being able to understand, but energetically, we both were communicating something. And I, I have a, a friend who her daughter was not able to speak for her whole life, but yet because of her eye movements and so forth and so on, they learned how to communicate without words. She was unable to learn sign language and she was really severely hand handicapped. And yet the energetic interaction with that person was just absolutely fantastic. Even when I met her, there was a way to communicate just because we were open to receiving and giving the energy, not just the words. And I've always, I, I found that really, really fascinating just as a personal experiment. Yeah, that I love that you bring that up, Rob, because that's just it. I miss out on that a lot because I'm so caught up in my thinking, my insecurity about my lack of being able to speak the language, that I'm not present for the energetic exchange that's available. I'm focusing on, I can't understand you, and so I, it's like I've got cotton in my ears. So I've been noticing that a little bit and noticing when it comes down, I actually can understand more because it's not just the words. You're right. It's everything. And then there is a way to connect with someone, even if we can't share a language as a way to communicate. 
Yeah, for for sure. And and I love how you talk about being present because really at the at the end of the day, that affects every part of our life. It's that presence, right? And so when you were talking about cotton in your ears, if you just think about it, if you're not present, you you are not experiencing the entire energetic conversation that's going on, even in a business meeting, right? If you're thinking about a million different things, you're there and you're catching pieces, but it's that presentness, which is so important. It's so important in, in all aspects. It's one of the things I learned for sure with uh, Desiree. And I don't know if I said her name before, that was my wife. And the idea of, because there was a, a time horizon in a way, and realizing that we had to pull ourselves out of the future, thinking about a cure or remission or something like that, and focus on, well, what is the best thing we could do today brought us to that skill of being present. And so I've been in your situation where I start thinking, I, but I don't understand. And then I, it is just to pull myself back. And there's, there's no right or wrong, right? There's going to be no failure if you don't understand. But if you're there fully present, you're actually giving yourself a tool to understand even better tomorrow. Mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. I've been watching myself in this and seeing things shift and it's a journey. I'm not there. I still have a lot of insecure thinking that comes up. Oh my God. There was, there was something Rob that you said that I loved that jumped out at me and this was some time back, but it, it keeps coming up. You said, I have a pen in my hand and I'm writing the narrative for things I can't control, I think you said. Yeah, out of my control. Yeah, yeah. things out of your control. Will you tell me more about what that means to you? Sure. Uh, th that's actually how I live my whole life. And I think unconsciously I stepped into that space as a child because I couldn't control my dad up until I got strong enough to actually fight back. <laughs> but up until that point, I couldn't. And there were two directions I could have gone in. One was the victim and, oh, woe is me. And this is part of when I work with clients as well. I'm like, look, I don't go, I'm not a digger. I don't want to go do archaeology and figure out the why of the past, right? I think the why for the future is much more important. So there's two mindsets here. Woe is me or wow is me. And that comes from my childhood. So for me, I was going to be the one that was going to be like a superhero, right? And, and I am a big superhero nerd. So, <laughs> you know, and so I started penning that narrative that this stuff that's happening with my dad is so cool. It's going to get me, make me stronger, do something. Literally, it did happen. Because if I didn't have that, quote, boot camp, Desiree having cancer and the 11-year journey, the adversity of that would have been overwhelming. Instead, the adversity became a contrast color on the painting of our lives. Because that was the narrative we were giving. It. So... When I talk about that, we cannot control, there's many times I'd like to say, well, like, damn it, just, the world needs to stop for five minutes, let me get my breath, and then we can all go back to living, but just stop. And I can't do that, right? <laughs> so I have to figure out, well, who am I? What is the narrative that I want to live through this experience? And that, I think, is is the key, let's say, to living a quality life. And it does sort of come, ties into palliative care very well as well. But if you think about it, and we were talking about this a little earlier, you know, the saying is know thyself. And, you know, the first Matrix movie, everyone learned it <laughs> if you're a Matrix fan. But, you know, I think many people watch that movie. 
I'm starting to believe, not just think about it or ponder, but truly believe and understand it's self-creation. I'm not a religious person whatsoever. I am spiritual. I do believe in energy. I do believe in creative forces. And yes, I would love to manifest a ton of money right here and maybe something over there. And, and yes, actions will do that. But I can manifest myself. I can create myself. And I think that's the biggest thing because at the end of the day, the energetic signature, this is going to be a weird line, the energetic signature we leave behind us is the legacy other people can read. That's very weird where that just came from, but anyway, it sort of fits. <laughs> At the end of the day, the example of how we lived is the true legacy we leave. Yeah. I like both ways you put that, Rob. The first one, because it had a feeling to it that I'm like, what does that mean? To leave behind an energetic signature, like a like a vapor trail of the energy that was Stephanie or Rob, that somehow it, is contributing to whatever is happening, still has a trace, has a shadow, leaves a becomes a part of. That's what I find actually when we pass that even if we leave out the energetic part, how could we? Because it's the stuff of which we are made. Like we have, we're made of star stuff. And what we are becomes a part of all that that is. It just goes on in other forms. And that's like the, the energy signature kind of says that to me a little bit. That's the feeling I get from it anyway. So that... I'm, I'm going to tie it to two different things. Mm. One of the things is I think of it as a hue. So like my favorite color is, is orange. And I leave a, I will leave a hue of orange that maybe other people can follow. It's sort of like how do birds migrate? And they say, well, birds migrate the same way because over all these years, there's this energetic thing that we don't see, but the birds can see and they'll follow it. I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I like to believe it, let's say. The other thing is in terms of the energy being part of all of it, right? Like we are part of something, even though we physically might not be here. I talk all the time that, and he will jump into Harry Potter for a second because I'm also a Harry Potter nerd, but you know, the scar on his head was from his mother's love, right? Protecting him. And so that was part of him. Just like Desiree, even though she's passed, it's a beautiful scar on my heart. It's an energetic beating part of me that will always be there that I can, again, it's a narrative thing, right? It's, oh, the person is not here or, wow, I am who I am because she was part of my life. And this could take us down a road of, and I think it's important for people to hear, so I'll bring us there for a second. Because gratitude, I think we have to be grateful for everything. And this is one of the hardest pieces of it, right? Because when crap happens, we don't want to be grateful for it. And we don't, we, we resist it. But it will come down, I believe it comes down to this, because this is a question I ask myself all the time. If I am happy with who I am, if I can say I truly have self-love, then I have to thank it all. If I don't have the self-love, if I'm not happy with who I am, then I have to ask myself what's under my control that I can change to bring me to that vision of who I want to be. And that goes all back to that self-creation again. So that also tied into the energetic thing in a weird way because we went on a, on, a, on a tangent. But Desiree 
yes, of course, I would love for her to see all that. I'm sure she is seeing it, but whatever, you know, be here with me. But then again, that was out of my control. What I've created from that, the story, the moving to Italy, the learning a new language, the, you know, new identity as an Italian citizen as well, all of that was because I took that crap and I started molding it, planting seeds, and I didn't water it with worry and doubt. I watered those seeds and the crap with optimism and curiosity, and therefore, whatever you water it with, right, is, is going to sprout, basically. Yeah. What occurs to me is that in every moment we are creating ourselves, whether we realize it or not. Writing the narrative, as you put it, with the thoughts we choose to give our attention. Yeah. And for me, rather than trying to You know, I, I think there there was a time when I did a lot of looking at my limiting beliefs, which are narratives, right? That were in my in my opinion holding me back, right? These and rewrite them, replace them. You know, I did my neuro linguistic programming training and we learned how to do these oh, I don't even remember what it's called now. It was years ago, but like switching things and, you know, replacing limiting beliefs with empowering ones. And I did that and saw changes in my life as a result, but not as deeply as I would have thought. Like I thought I could go in there and get that limiting belief out, like pull it out like it was a weed and then it would be gone. But it wasn't like sometimes things would change and sometimes things came back. And I was like, well, what's going on? I must not have done a good enough job. And there were always more roots to pull out, right? But at some point, I started to see that if I know I'm telling a story with my thoughts, if I know that I am creating myself with the thoughts I give my attention to, the ones that look real in this moment, I actually don't need to change the story to change my experience. Mm. Like I can actually see, oh, I'm telling a story that Stephanie's a victim right now. Okay. Because if I'm telling the story, for one, sometimes it's hard to change it, right? When I'm in the middle of it, when it's sucking me in, I have influence but not control is how it seems sure. to me. Like, like I can, but if I don't see it, and sometimes I just don't see it because I'm too deep in the shit. I'm too deep in it. I can't see it in that moment. It's like the choice doesn't exist. It does exist, but I've forgotten in that moment. But as soon as I can see myself creating myself, creating a painful experience for myself or a joyful experience for myself, there is a choice, a space of choice that opens up, which I may or may not take. And that space, no matter how tiny, there's freedom that lives there. There is an infinity of space in that, even though it may be so tiny, even though I may stay stuck in my victim story for and throw a tantrum for the next five minutes about something. But it's loosened it up for me now so I can watch the story unfold more. And, and it does change because as soon as I see that, as soon as we see that we're creating ourselves in a certain way, we can see that we can do it differently. We can bring our attention to different things like you're saying gratitude and what do I want to create? What life do I really want to be living instead of lamenting the one that I have or regretting the things that I don't have? Oh, wow. There's, there's so much that resonates with me and so much that I, I, I would love to unpack. You know, one of the things that, that came up for me, th there's, there's so much because that, that tiny little space is just full of so many possibilities. And what we're talking about, you know, like the limiting beliefs and pulling them out. And then there's other things. I mean, this is a lifestyle. 
you and I are talking about a lifestyle. It is not something that we do once and everything is just going to be okay and the rainbow and unicorn and everything is going to show up. But it's where agency comes from, right? Now, there, there's a couple of things I learned. One is when we are in the victim story, we're searching for something. Everything we do consciously or unconsciously, we're doing for a benefit. That's just what human beings are all about. So maybe the victim story is in that moment because we can't express something. And really what we're looking for is someone to say, I know how tough it is, or, oh, you know, let me give you a hug. There's something that's not, we're not able to express yet. We're not stepping into that vulnerability. The next point is what I've realized with my own journey is this idea of understanding the narrative is that we have to practice it. And what I mean by that is if you go to a self-defense class, they can teach you the moves, but you actually have to imagine that someone's attacking you. So you can then be responsive when it happens in the future instead of reactive because you've already created that identity within. So I do quit when I find myself in, let's say, because I fall into that all the time. I, you know, I have all my different things that I will have a tantrum for five minutes or five days or whatever the case is, but I will sit there and I will unpack it and understand, well, what, how would I have liked to show up? And that gives me the agency to start to build that in and remind myself however I do it, whether it's a mantra or something else. And, and the other thing, and I, I love NLP, NPL, I forget how you say it because it's backwards in Italy. <laughs> they, they do the letters backwards, you know? So like AIDS is SIDS. But anyway, so um, affirmations, I think what we've lost in affirmations is our brains need evidence. So if we're saying something contrary to the limiting belief to replace it, we need to give ourselves the evidence of how that thing we're saying is true. So the voice inside can say, oh, wait a minute, maybe, yeah, maybe this isn't really true. But if we just say, I am a good person or I am abundant and we don't feel it, well, in the back of our head, there's going to be this, you're a liar. Ah, what are you saying? You're bullshitting me. Um, but on the other side, if we give evidence, that voice has to listen for a moment. And it's that moment where change can start to take place. That's interesting. I had not thought of affirmations in that way. I call them how affirmations. How <laughs> I don't know. I made up a word. <laughs> how is it true? So what, what I enjoy so much about you, Rob, is how alive you are in life. You know, like I, I feel it in what you're doing. It feels to me like you're exploding with life. And whatever direction it takes you, whatever experience you're having, there's a vibrancy to it. You're living it. You're like saying, okay, live it. Now, I'm sure in some moments, like you're saying, please, life, just give me five minutes. Just stop for five minutes. Right? <laughs> like, it probably doesn't feel that way all the time, but my experience of you is that. And it's like I wrote a story a few years ago about the woman who wrote her life, and it was – she didn't realize well, how did the story go? I can remember my own story. <laughs> she, every morning she would get up and write in her journal and forget what she had written and then go out and live it. And she didn't know she was doing that until one day she woke up and she saw what she was doing. And she's like, I'm writing this. I'm writing my life. What if I don't? And she stopped writing and her life went off track. It went off the rails. But what happened was she came back to her life 
the one that she had and she embraced it. She appreciated it in a way that she couldn't have before. Her husband had been like out looking for her because she was just gone all day. Like she didn't show up at work and where the hell did she go? And she was off on these adventures, right? And But she came home. And what am I pointing to with this? There's a willingness to, to, to live the story, whatever story I'm in, to see the story, to show up with it. And know myself as more than the story, as feel myself as the paper the story is being written on that makes the story more enjoyable even when it doesn't go the way I want, that helps me to to recognize the agency that I do have, the influence that I do have on the story when it gets tough. Sure. And not be so attached to my joyful stories either, because they can be just as uh, debilitating sometimes if I hang on to them. You know, like needing it to stay, hanging. Yeah. Wow, you, you, you are so touching on something that is is so crucial to me. And I think one of the most beautiful representations of all of this is the ancient Japanese calendar. And I had no idea, but the ancient Japanese had 72 micro seasons. Their calendar was 72 seasons. Talking about impermanence, to reflect upon just the idea of impermanence. The good feelings are not going to stay. This too shall pass is, is actually for everything. We just like to wield that when it's a horrible thing, right? But it's all passing. And, and I think it's acknowledging that and embracing that and then realizing that if we just approach everything with curiosity, when you talk about that aliveness, which thank you very much, because um, I do feel, I get very excited when I talk about this stuff as well, but I feel like a kid, you know, I'm, getting up there in, in age, but I, I, I definitely, I feel like a kid. And that is because I just, I know this is all going to end. And I know I have no control over that. I, I, I live that with Desiree to the point where I don't know how many times, because they had given us a three year life expectancy and she lived 11, how many times she would rally after being in the hospital that it just, when the moment came, it seemed like it was a second from the diagnosis to the death. Those 11 years went like that. And so when I look at all this and I say, well, this is all going to end. And how can I truly fail at life? For me, I feel I can only quote fail. And I don't believe there is failure. Let's say just, I just want to make sure that it's clear. But for me, if I don't go out there and try, if I don't go out there and test my limits, if I don't try to create something new, that to me is a waste of this experience that someone handed to me and someone will take away in terms of there's no control over that. I didn't choose, well, people say we choose to be born and all that other stuff, but regardless of the case, you know, <laughs> I don't remember that conscious decision and one day it's going to end and I'm not the conductor on that train, but I can get on and off and experience the places along the way and play and get my hands all dirty and say, well, I lived life to the utmost. Now I live a very simple life as well. Like, you know, so you, once we become, this is something I journaled about last night. Wow, this is really clear. Once we become very clear about what we want in life, life is black and white. It's that simple. It's a yes and it's a no. And we don't, the dreaming, and I, I don't know why this is what I journaled last night, but dreams are in technicolor. Clarity is in black and white. And I chose to live a very simple life so I can experience 
autonomy and freedom that normally you would need a lot of money for. And that is because that is the narrative of the story. I want to explore. I really do want to explore. I love to go around a corner and there's something new and then I, I might forget it. Or because it's like, it sounds horrible, but it's like, it's, 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 it's a big play plant because it's going to go away. So I don't know. <laughs> crazy thought. I know. Very crazy thought. Not so crazy. But one, one, yeah. No, go ahead. Sorry. No, I said not so crazy. We're having a little internet Not so crazy. Okay. Playing with us. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, when we're kids, and this, this show showed up in my grief work at the beginning. So this is where it somewhat comes from. But, you know, if you think of a funeral and there are a bunch of young kids there, let's say five to eight years old or something like that, they may see grandma in the casket or something like that. But before long, they might be hiding behind a little tree or something and they'll start giggling together. They don't have all the data we have convinced ourselves are is all relevant to predict life. And so they're actually more, as you talked about earlier, they're more present. They're experiencing life. There's a lot of crap I wish I didn't experience. 100%, I, I will say it for sure. There's going to be more shit in the future that I'm going to be like, really? Like, I've tasted the sandwich already. I don't want to taste the sandwich again. But again, that's all out of my control. So if I can sit there and empower myself to just realize this is part of the whole journey that's going to happen, how am I going to experience it? Am I going to resist it? Am I going to accept it? Am I going to work with it? Am I going to create from it? Who am I? This is where something really big happens. You know, we're not going to just jump into curiosity. <laughs> of course not. But if we are consciously aware that, like you said, you're the piece of paper, when we're consciously aware of that and we keep that in the front of our mind, even when we're in that situation, which is really, really horrible and the front of our mind shuts off because it's the amygdala that's going to get us through that, that piece is there to remind us and it might take some time but if we can build that circuit right think about driving into the far driving into a field you're on the highway it's, it's it's perfectly smooth you drive into the wheat field and you try to cross a different way it's all bumpy and you, there's no track laid the next time there's more track the next time there's more tracks soon that's a smooth path that's the same thing we're doing with our brain, which you know, because of the old NPL, NLP, PPL, whatever it's called thing. So, <laughs> which I studied as well, but I could never remember the acronym. Mm. Mm. So, you want to share a little bit about this latest creation of yours? Fuck it. I want to hear. <laughs> okay, so it's fuck this. Oh, fuck um, this. Sorry. All right. Well, you know, fuck, this. fuck it. Fuck no, this. But they, but, no, but there's a, there's a huge difference. So I love that you said that, right? Fuck it is, is more, let's say, from a, this is in my own mind, but is more an anger point of view. Like, fuck it. Where fuck this is, oh, I'm not going to stand for this anymore. Mm. Like, I'm going to step in. And I'm going to start to change things because I don't like the way this is going. And so this really came out of, uh, you know, you know, I'm, I'm very, very open. So I've never been what I would say was clinically depressed. I've been down. I've been sad at times. So, so I, I've never been someone that I would ever say was, was depressed. I literally, the holiday season, couldn't get out of bed. 
and I couldn't figure out why. Until I finally realized that for me, if I don't have some big, crazy project that's going to push my limits, that self-creation thing, I feel like there's no reason to wake up, or at least that's what came to me when I was thinking about that. Because I, have a, I ha do have a great life. I have the exact dream that I wanted to write after Desiree passed away. And I could just stay here. Perfect. And that felt like resignation to me. And so I've been in situations where when I'm not happy with the way things are going in my life, I say, fuck this. I'm going to get to work and I'm going to make something change. So the idea, the concept of this really is it's a block. It's, it's, it's a coaching. It's a group coaching program, sort of a blog, sort of. Basically, I'm writing my thoughts weekly about fuck this, like, you know, fucking own it or whatever else. And I'm using the language because it has been shown, especially in today's world where everything is so vanilla and so you can't say anything and you, everyone's offended and jarring language interrupts habitual thing. Now, there's going to be people that it interrupts it in a way where they back away. And there's going to be people that it interrupts habitual thinking and they're like, oh, you know what? Yeah, I want to go down that route. So I decided to write this blog coming out in March. And once a month, we're going to have a group call and we're going to say, well, how's it going? You know, we're like a Q&A type thing, because I don't believe to be an expert. I'm an expert. I'm becoming an expert and I will always be becoming. We're all just becoming. Um because again, if the train is not under our control, we're going to be in the middle of becoming, and then it's all going to end. Like I always think of you being in Spain. No, you're in Portugal. Sorry, but okay, let's go to Spain. Um, La Sagrada Familia. Gaudi didn't finish that church. Didn't make him feel like a failure. You know, it was the chipping of the, the doing every day. Michelangelo chipping, chipping every day at David, right? Could have died halfway through. So the idea that I'm an expert in the way I see things and that I'm an expert or becoming an expert in the way I live. If that's of value to someone to say, hmm, I want to be more in control of my own narrative. Fuck this to living the way I'm living. Yeah. So that's where it all came from. I just finally said, you know what? I'm known for the brand possibility and action, right? Possibility and action is the lifestyle. Fuck this is more of the mindset that gets you to the possibility and action because it's saying, no, I'm not going to tolerate this in my life. And that's whatever the case is, right? It could be cutting out people that drain your energy. It could be saying, no, I'm not going to eat this next donut. I'm a diabetic. And yes, I could go get a stronger pill or I'm going to take control of my diet. So that's like, fuck it would be more like, I'm going to eat the donut and take a pill. <laughs> oh my goodness. I have such a strong image and feeling and the image is, is quite funny the way I'm conjuring it of of you looking at this pile of shit that life has delivered to your doorstep and going fuck this but it's like embracing it you know it's it's not throwing it away it's embracing it and letting it be the <laughs> it's so graphic the way i'm seeing it though letting it be the the medium through which you create, like actually through embracing it, through living it. And <laughs> so there you're, 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 you're cracking me up right now because I literally just wrote yesterday. So um, that's exactly the image, by the way, that, <laughs> that, that, that is it, right? First of all, I am someone that 
I throw myself face down in the shit. Like I will, I'm going to eat it all up. I, you know, I'm, I, I have to acknowledge it 100%. Well, what I was ex- explaining in this thing that I was writing was that fuck it is to try to push it away and take some aerosol can and spray. And ooh, I don't really smell it. It's over there, right? And fuck this is like, all right, well, what can I do with it? And it's, it's true that the horrible things in life are points of transition. They are, you were talking about the word invitation, and I love that word invitation. And, you know, look, I'm, I'm not belittling anything here, right? Like, it, it sucked when Desiree died. It was, it, was, it was miserable. I didn't just rally the next day, right? I, I, my dad was an alcoholic. I never wanted to be an alcoholic. I never wanted to drink. Oh, did I drink? Um, did I engage in all kinds of things? I, I, I found that, you know, the only way I felt alive was the needle of a tattoo. And so that all of a sudden that took me down a <laughs> dark road <laughs> for about a year. So, um, it's, it's not belittling those points, but at some point in time, we're going to realize that the transition has destroyed what was behind us, meaning that it's never going to be the same. Even if it's a small transition, you know, whatever, whatever it is, a transition, the past will not be as we remember. The future can be whatever we decide. And that's where it is. And uh, I'm just going to like Desiree, right? Metastatic breast cancer. A, you know, chemotherapy leaked in her chest wall. We had to remove part of her liver at one point in time. Um, ablation therapy, all, all, all kinds of things, right? She became the founding director of palliative care at New York Hospital. The founding director. Chemo every other Friday for 11 years. How did that happen? That happened because it wasn't the circumstances that defined her life. It's not the circumstances that define my life. All of us can make that decision. It's what we do with those circumstances. Mm. So that's fuck this. Well, if someone wants to fuck this with you. (laughs) All right. I'm going to have to figure out how to market that one, but okay. How, where might they go to learn more about said experience? So, uh, of course, they could go to my website because there is actually a section that says, fuck this. Um, If they subscribe to Substack, that's where the um, newsletter will be. And um, it's super, as everyone tells me, I'm being very stupid here. I don't think so at all. It's extremely accessible. It's like, you know a Starbucks coffee. <laughs> so, because I want to have fun as well. This is a sandbox I've always wanted to play in. I'm usually there by myself. And, you know, I'm about to share the tractor and pail and shovel with other people if they want to play. So, yeah. Oh, beautiful. Well, I will be sure to share that link in the description under the video and the blog post, et cetera, so people can find it and, and join join the play. Wow. Well, Rob, thank you so much for sharing this, for sharing the aliveness of everything that you've been experiencing. I really appreciate it. It's beautiful. Uh, I so appreciate you and appreciate you inviting me. I mean, I, we could talk for Thanks so much for joining me for today's Wildspire conversation. If you'd like to receive a weekly Wildspire email from me filled with inspiring stories, unmarketing experiments, tips for playing your way to impact and income without the hustle and hype, insights from my spiritual business journey, and more, go to theawakenedbusiness.com forward slash Wildspire. Until next time, may you know yourself as the gorgeous wild creation you are.